I'm very concerned that there are lots of folks, especially in the church today, who have gotten turned on to some degree to critical race theory, and they're trying to hold on to their Christian worldview as they start to embrace this critical race theory worldview. And what they're going to, what's going to happen, and we've seen this happen with a number of theologians uh, already, is they're going to recognize eventually that there is some conflict between the two, and they'll have to choose. And what we see is a significant number choosing critical race theory or critical theory generally and abandoning traditional Christianity. What I'd like to do now is to discuss with you some of the problems with critical race theory, at least problems from the standpoint of, of folks like me and, and others. And I'd like to divide my discussion into two parts. First of all, I want to consider the problems that are a concern from the standpoint of our culture, our, even our civilization as a whole. In other words, problems that should be of concern to anyone and everyone, uh, regardless whether they're Christians. And then second, uh, problems that are of concern or should be of concern uh, to Christians, and more specifically to um, evangelical Protestant Christians. So let's begin with part one. From the standpoint of our culture, our society, maybe even our civilization as a whole, what is problematic about critical race theory? Well, I can think of at least three things. The first problem is that critical race theory at some level, like all critical theory, represents something of an attack on what I call rationality uh, itself. Remember the rejection of the notion of objectivity. Remember also the insistence upon uh, alternative ways of knowing, alternative epistemologies. And not just alternatives, but ways of knowing that supposedly are superior to what has in Western thought traditionally been thought of as the best, if not the only way of knowing. That is, you know, lived experience as opposed to logic, rationality, and, and uh, testing, and, and evidence. This strikes me as being a, a significant problem uh, in our culture for the same reason that um, Neil Shinvey's identified, and I want to quote what he's written here. Because of this aspect of the theory, when someone makes a truth claim, the first question asked by critical theory is not, is this claim true, but what incentives does this person have to make this claim? What political or social or economic agenda motivates his statement? How does the statement function to preserve his power and privilege? Now, as Shinvey points out, this kind of move in the face of a truth claim is actually a kind of recognized logical fallacy in itself. Uh, it's called bulverism by C.S. Lewis. It's a kind of genetic fallacy. It rejects something as false simply because of the assumed motives of the person making the claim. I think that's a very dangerous, uh, a very dangerous idea because, again, it undermines the very foundations of what we in Western culture have historically understood is the very, the very way, the best way, maybe even the only way of developing knowledge. And if, if that way of developing knowledge is compromised, then the repercussions for the future development of, of knowledge, or at least the development of knowledge in this way, I think could be seriously undermined with all kinds of unfortunate cultural and indeed civilizational effects. The second problem with critical race theory and indeed all of critical theory from the standpoint of the culture of the civilization as a whole is closely related to the first, and that is that it stifles free intellectual inquiry. Um, again, from Neil Shinvey, if a person making the truth claim belongs to an oppressor group, then the response from critical uh, theory is, of course they would say that, they're just trying to maintain their power and privilege. If the statement is made by the truth claim by a member of the oppressed group, then the answer is, well, he's just speaking from internalized oppression. The subordinate individual has internalized and accepted the, the claims of the dominant group. Well, you can see that what this does is to shut down further discussion of whatever issue has been raised. And it shuts it down because, again, immediately the person who is speaking saying, well, I don't see that there's a problem or that problem is not true uh, with respect to me, 
his motivations are immediately questioned, and the motivations having been questioned, and having been not just questioned, but explained away by this ready-made theory, oh, he's simply speaking from a desire to maintain his oppression or from his, if he's an oppressed person, uh, his false consciousness, immediately puts that person on the defensive and, for the most part, will, in many cases, just shut him down. Again, um, another term that is used to describe this, this uh, phenomenon uh, is fragility. It is said by the adherents of critical uh, uh, theory that whenever a person in an oppressor group in response to some charge having to do with his group's oppression says, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't think there's any oppression going on, or it certainly isn't true of me, that simply shows his supposed fragility. Fragility at what? At uh, really, at some subconscious level at least, recognizing that there is some truth to the claim that racism or sexism is really going on here, but him putting himself into this defensive posture denying that it is, Again, if that is going to be the kind of response that a critical theorist or a critical race theorist gives to someone who disagrees with him, the person on the other side is not going to, in most cases, be willing, would you, to continue the discussion. And so again, the effect is that further debate and therefore further inquiry with a view to getting the truth is actually shut down, almost as it were, by assumptions in advance. The third problem with critical race theory in particular, not just critical theory generally, but critical race theory uh, from the standpoint of the culture uh, as a whole, is that it has the effect or can have the effect of diverting attention away from what I and many others believe are the true causes of the social pathologies that we see within the black community in the United States and maybe uh, even elsewhere uh, throughout the West. This theory provides an explanation of why it is that blacks lag behind whites and Asians as well in so many uh, categories of social, political, and economic performance. Why their uh, blacks have higher poverty rates, why it is that they have higher rates of, of crime and incarceration. The theory says it's all because of oppressive social structures. And implicitly what the theory says is, this is all happening due to circumstances that are beyond the control of those to whom it happens. Well, I don't want to get into this very deeply, but I happen to be persuaded, as are many others, including a number of black intellectuals. Thomas Sowell is one of them, um, uh, noted economist. Uh, Vody Bauckham, noted theologian and pastor, that at least many of the problems that beset the black community in the United States are what we would call cultural or maybe subcultural. They have to do with, with practices and values within the community that are themselves self-defeating. The one that Vody Bauckham focuses on is the, the crisis of fatherlessness in the African American community. Well, these are, are problems that at least to some degree can be combated um, only by making a change of, of culture, shall we say. Now, here's the thing. As Vody Bauckham correctly points out, if you subscribe to critical race theory, that possibility never occurs to you. The solution to the problem is to change the social structures, and until that gets changed, no improvement will be seen. And so, focusing on that instead of on this other cause, I'm not saying this, these these cultural problems are the only causes of, of pathologies in the African American community, but I think they're there. And critical race theory has the effect of taking our attention off of them and onto this other thing, the supposed oppression, with the result that I think these um, underlying problems that could be developed by a change of culture are not going to get addressed. Okay, those are the problems with critical race theory uh, from the standpoint of the culture, the civilization as a whole. I now want to focus in on what I consider to be the problems of critical race theory for Christianity, and more specifically for evangelical Christianity. Critical theory as a whole, of which critical race theory is a part, 
functions not only as a theory and not only as an agenda for political action, it functions as what we might call a worldview or what Thomas Sowell calls a vision or what the postmodernists call a meta narrative. That is, it's a whole way of looking at reality. And it's a way of looking at reality that is presupposed and is brought to the experience of encountering uh, reality. What does a worldview or a meta narrative do for you? Well, it's what answers the most fundamental questions of life. Like who, who are we? Uh, what is our fundamental problem, if any, if, as human beings? What's the solution to that problem? What is our principal moral duty? What is our purpose in life? Well, here's the troubling thing. If you compare the Christian worldview, and there is such a thing, because Christianity is not just a, a faith or a religion, if you want to use that term. It is also a whole way of looking at the entirety of reality. If you contrast the Christian worldview with the critical theory worldview, you see that there are a number of points at which they don't line up. In fact, you see some points at which they are quite different. We I mean, consider the Christian worldview's answer to these questions. Who are we? We're beings that were created by God, by a holy, just, all-powerful creator. What's our fundamental problem? We rebelled against him. Sin. What's the solution to the problem? God sent Jesus to die an atoning death on the cross to pay the sin debt that we couldn't pay, to fix the rebellion, reconcile us to God. What's our primary moral duty? To love God, glorify Him. What's our purpose? To glorify God. Now contrast that set of answers to these fundamental questions that are provided by the Christian worldview with the answers to the same questions, if there are any, that are provided by the worldview that is a part of critical theory. There is, first of all, no answer to the question, really, who are we? Uh, at least not in the sense of where did we come from. To the extent that there's an answer to the question of who are we, the answer is that we are members of different kinds of social identity groups. Where they came from is not necessarily uh, explained. There is no creator in the background. Okay, so um, what is our principal problem? Our principal problem is the oppression that takes place between social identity groups. In particular, the problem is the, the, uh, the adverse effects that the oppression has on, on the oppressed. Um, what's the solution? Well, the solution is various kinds of activism, political uh, to start with, but also social and, and even economic. Uh, what is our primary moral duty? It is to overthrow the uh, hegemonic power with a view of liberating um, the oppressed. What's the purpose in life? It is to um, work for the liberation of all oppressed peoples. Notice that in response to every one of these fundamental questions that a worldview takes on, the Christian worldview and the critical theory worldview provide very different answers. And uh, like, like others, including uh, Neil Shinvey, I'm very concerned that there are lots of folks, especially in the church today, who have gotten turned on to some degree to critical race theory. And they're trying to hold on to their Christian worldview as they start to embrace this critical race theory worldview. And what they're going to, what's going to happen, and we've seen this happen with a number of theologians uh, already, is they're going to recognize eventually that there is some conflict between the two, and they'll have to choose. And what we see is a significant number choosing critical race theory or critical theory generally and abandoning traditional Christianity. All right, the second problem with the um, uh, critical race theory and critical theory generally uh, from the standpoint of uh, evangelical uh, Christianity uh, has to do with epistemology, again, which is, means theory of knowing or how it is that we know. And this is a problem that I touched on when I was talking about the problems with critical race theory or critical theory from the standpoint of the culture and the civilization as a whole, right? Remember what we said there. There's a rejection of traditional rationality, of traditional logic, a rejection of the very idea that there might be objective truth. That is a problem, as I indicated before, for the culture of the civilization as a whole, but I submit to you that it's also a particular problem for the church. Why? Because Christianity teaches that there is an objective truth. Yes? 
there is an objective truth about who we are. It is, there is an objective truth about where we've come from. And how do we get to that objective truth? We get to that objective truth by looking at, because we're Protestants, the Scriptures. And we say that the Scriptures are, if we're at least we're Orthodox Protestants, we say that they are infallible, yes, inerrant. What does that mean? It means that we're talking about objective truth that is true for everybody, everywhere, and importantly, everybody, regardless of what social identity group he might be a part of. This objective truth that we find in the Bible, uh, it doesn't sit very well with the critical theory. Um, whenever someone from an oppressor group makes some kind of theological claim, uh, it's, it's the, the tendency of, of critical theory to respond by saying, well, that's not because it's really true, it's because, again, of what? You're trying to maintain your privilege. And again, if it's a, an oppressed person who makes this traditional theological claim, the response can be, well, that's the result of your internalized oppression of your false consciousness. And uh, w what about concrete questions uh, having to do with, with women? Well, the reason that you say that women can't be pastors is, again, a reflection of your patriarchal mindset. And maybe from there we go farther. Well, aren't uh, gay and lesbian and transgender people um, uh, oppressed? Yes, they are. So whenever it is stated that uh, homosexual conduct is a sin, how do we know that that's really true? Uh, instead, it may simply be your, your privilege talking if you're a member of the oppressor group or your false consciousness if you're a member of the uh, oppressed group. So the, the bottom line here, and if I can sum this up under the heading of epistemology, is the rejection of objective truth that is knowable not only, shall we say, to an oppressed person, but also to an oppressor is very, very difficult to line up with some of the fundamental premises of critical race theory. Another problem with critical race theory has to do with its tendency to create adversarial identities. Remember what we said at the very beginning of our examination of the key elements of critical uh, theory, and that was that it indicates that identity, even in, at the individual level, individual's identity is determined by, shaped by, uh, what social identity group he's a part of. And so, again, critical race theory posits that human beings are in some way fundamentally different. They're either in this social identity group, oppressor, or they're in that social identity group, uh, oppressed. Now, if you have some contrary notion that at some fundamental level, uh, human beings are in fact not different, but that they're very much alike, that there is, in other words, an identity uh, that they share in common that is fundamentally at odds with what is taught by critical race theory. Now, let's consider orthodox Protestant theology. What does it say about humankind? It says that humankind does, in fact, share an identity that is independent of these social identity groups. We share, first of all, an identity in terms of the fact that we were created by God in His image. Everyone, oppressors and oppressed. Second, we share this common identity of being fallen or rebels. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, not just the oppressors, but also the oppressed. And then at least for those of us who are Christians, we also share an identity in terms of being redeemed, yes, of having our sin problem being fixed. And that is something that is available to oppressors as well as the oppressed. Yes, as Paul said, in Jesus Christ there is no Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. So traditional Christian theology does teach that there is a fundamental identity, actually multiple fundamental identities among people even of different social identity groups. And again, that is that identity there is sort of primordial from the uh, standpoint of traditional Christian theology. 
which of course focuses on the redemptive work of Christ. Another problem with critical race theory and critical theory generally from the standpoint of evangelicalism is this whole notion of hegemonic power. In critical race theory, as in every other version of neo-Marxism going all the way back to Gramsci, hegemonic power is something awful. It is something to be resisted. It is something that is somehow illegitimate. Well, how do we square that with the Bible? I'm not talking about what the Bible has to say about social, political, economic power. I'm digging a little bit more deeply here, just as Neil Shinvi has. What about God himself? Is it not true that God is described as a hegemonic power? That he is sovereign? That eventually every knee will bow and every tongue confess? Yes. The story, as Neil Shinvi correctly says, of the Bible from the beginning to the end is about God's hegemony over man. If your worldview is such that you consider hegemony to be a bad thing in itself, then have you not rejected, at least implicitly, a fundamental aspect of traditional Christian theology? Another problem from the standpoint of evangelicalism, it's what I'm going to call the unpardonable sin. In the works of the really dyed-in-the-wool critical theorists, in particular critical race theorists, there seems to be some suggestion that racism is something that no white person can possibly escape from, at least in the society as it exists now. Remember that critical race theory has a rather different conception of racism and of oppression than has been traditionally the case, and that is that it's all systemic. Yes, the social structures are in place in such a way as to oppress. If you're a member of the oppressor group, simply by being there in the culture, you are a participant in it and a, a facilitator of it. To that extent, even if you have no individual hostile animus uh, in your heart of hearts, you're still a racist or a sexist, as the case uh, might be. Well, again, the really hardcore critical race theorists suggest that in the society and as it exists now, before the appropriate correctives have come into play, whatever they may be, it's impossible for a white person to escape racism, no matter what he might do. Uh, even, and this is, this is at some level so mind-boggling, even if he does what is generally prescribed, that is, uh, not challenge the lived experience of members of the express groups whenever they explain it, but instead, you know, listens to them and says, okay, I, you told me that you feel oppressed by this or you feel discriminated against here. Uh, I have to accept that as, as true. Well, some of the theorists are so radical that they say, even in this very act, the white person is acting as a racist. How? He's guilty of epistemic exploitation. Meaning, what? Or, I'm sorry, it, well, that is one way to ex uh, express it, but the more common way is epistemic appropriation. Why? He has now put his hands on this knowledge that supposedly is unique to the oppressed person. And in that way, even by trying to be non-racist, has ended up being inadvertently racist. This idea that there is some kind of sin that can never be escaped. There is a notion of the unpardonable sin in the scriptures, and it's reflected in um, traditional theology, but we know it has nothing to do with this. There's a problem, a disconnect here between the Christian worldview and the worldview of critical legal theory. And then finally, one last problem I want to talk about with critical uh, race theory and critical theory generally um, from the standpoint of evangelicalism is the moral asymmetry that it gives rise to. Um, it is said, according to the critical race theorists, that there might be some things that are immoral for a member of the oppressor group, but not immoral for a member of the oppressed group. The uh, most salient example that we see around us today has to do with uh, racism in particular. It is claimed by the critical race theorists, at least some of them, that non-whites are, by definition, 
incapable of racism. This is in part because of the way that racism has been redescribed as not just uh, a, an attempt or a desire to oppress, but also power to do so. It's said that the non-whites do not have this power, therefore they cannot possibly be racist. And what that opens the door to is not just the possibility, but the reality, because we see it everywhere, of people in the non-white groups making statements about whites as a whole or individual rights, that if you turn them around and refocus them on um, blacks or whoever, non-whites, would be completely unacceptable. It's okay for uh, blacks, for example, to say the, the most horrible things about whites as a whole. Can they be saved? Uh, they need to be um, imprisoned. They, they need to be uh, even, even exterminated. And then also, it, it's, we've seen instances of, of blacks uh, in, including some who claim to be Christians, saying the most dreadful things uh, uh, about individual uh, whites, that again, if you turn them around, would sound racist. But the response from the critical race theorist people is, it's not really racist and therefore not really sinful because, uh, again, the people making the statements are in the oppressed group instead of the oppressor group. But from the standpoint of traditional Christian moral theology, this is a very pro uh, problematic idea, and that's because in traditional Christian moral theology, the, the norms that are established are universal. They apply to everybody, not just to the uh, oppressors, but also to the oppressed. Indeed, if you think about the commands that God gives, uh, for the most part, they're not even addressed to different kinds of, of groups. There are exceptions, there are directions for husbands, directions for, for wives, but for the most part, the directives uh, are addressed to all Christians or to all faithful, whoever they might, might be, whether it's the Jews in the Old Testament or Christians in the, in the New Testament. In those instances in which the Bible does give directives to particular groups, something else that's worth noting is that what is commanded at a bare minimum is mutual respect uh, and deference. The Bible does recognize that people who have authority can possibly wield it in, in poor ways, but the, the Bible never rejects authority in itself. In fact, if we think specifically about political authority, which is very much a concern of critical race theory, what the Scripture says is that this authority is established by God Himself. So, Again, what we, the message that we get from the Scriptures when it comes to moral theology is that what is, shall I say, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, that there are no situations in which it's okay for one person to engage in behavior that for another would be considered immoral or sinful. So if I can wrap this up here, I'm finished going through the, the various uh, items of collision between the the Christian worldview and uh, the, the worldview that's associated with critical race theory. Again, there are just a number of points of not just mismatch, but fundamental disagreement. And that it should be a concern to every Christian today as we witness this growth of interest in and promotion of critical race theory. At the end of the day, it is an alien worldview that threatens the possibility of supplanting the Christian worldview. These then are the points of disconnect between traditional evangelical Christianity on the one hand and critical race theory on the other. Again, worldview, epistemology, uh, adversarial identities, hegemonic power, unpardonable sin of racism and moral asymmetry. When you consider these points of disconnect, I think you have to recognize that in fact critical race theory and Christianity not only are incompatible, but that critical race theory poses a genuine threat to orthodox evangelical Protestantism. Thank you so much for taking time to watch this episode. I want to encourage you, if you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe button, and comment if you have any questions, and share with your friends, family, pastors, church members, 
And let me encourage you to continue to think well about these things. I don't have all the answers here on these episodes. I'm not being comprehensive of these subjects, but I'm hoping to at least introduce it to you so you can better know the playing field. Uh, if you have any questions or if you want to see more content, you can go to my website, travismcneely.com, or follow me on social media while I post things there regularly as well. Uh, please reach out to me if I could help in any way. Thank you.